What's up, fellas? If you want to get big as fast as possible, don't watch clickbait videos that tell you you're going to become a mass monster in 30 days, or it's an exaggeration, but anything that you want to achieve is not going to be done quickly. What we're doing is avoiding road bumps, and there's four major things that people of all experience levels, beginner, advanced, these are common things that people just don't maximize. So first and foremost, bro, outside of the gym variables, this is making sure that you go to bed on time, making sure that you eat enough protein, that you're eating enough calories to support your training, that you're drinking enough water, getting your electrolytes in. And I don't talk about this a lot, but you're digesting your food well and making sure that you're eating high quality shit that you can digest, okay? More importantly, you're in the gym variables. Your training is what is going to drive your adaptation. There are a lot of people that, you know, they're big eaters, okay? Especially if you're in the West, so you see a lot of heavy people that aren't necessarily jacked, right? You wanna make sure that you are mindful in your training and that you're efficient. There's a lot of people that think they're resting three minutes in between sets, and it's really like eight minutes because they're on their phone, they're doing this, they're thinking about other things. When you're mindful, you're present, and you're efficient, you're gonna have a good workout. And just having a good workout in general is something that's lost on people. We don't go to the gym to avoid discomfort. We don't go to the gym to avoid fatigue. In this meadow where everybody's trying to minimize those things, those three things all fall into have good in the gym habits. Now also, you wanna run a program that is proven, that is based on proven principles that allows you to reach your goals. With that, the fourth thing is, is that you have to have clear and specific goals in mind. Not just, I wanna get jacked. How about, I want to improve my arms. I wanna improve my bench press. That allows you to pick a program that is going to suit your goals. Now, Beast Slayer is for free in the description. Everybody has been loving it. For most people, I'm gonna recommend the hybrid version. I'm using that myself, at least the version of it. And it's gonna to apply to the most people possible from beginner all the way up to very, very advanced because obviously I'm running it myself. That was today's quick tips, fellas, short and sweet. We're gonna get right into the first hot take, which is freaking spicy, I must say. Dude, this hot take is so spicy, I can't even release the unedited version into the universe. But essentially, paraphrasing, they're saying guys like the Trend Twins, Sam Sulek, they're better for inspiration for newbie gains than a lot of other content creators that they could watch. Here's how I feel about that, bro. First and foremost, before we get into that, you let me know what you feel. Like, what is your opinion on that? I think that in general, you're gonna be the most receptive to information that is delivered in the way that is gonna vibe with your psychology. Meaning, for me, I can appreciate like a sweaty psychopath smashing weights, bro. That's just, that's just the type of content I like. But I'm also someone that likes a more cerebral breakdown. Some people are just like one or the other. Some people love that bland, drab, math teacher type of video where like, this is how you bench bros. And, some people love that. Some people would watch two seconds of that and then freaking click off, okay? Much the same when it comes to the Trend Twins. I've never watched any of their content, but their name is hilarious. So it sounds like something I may be interested in. Just find name Trend Twins to be funny. Listen, one of my favorite content creators was Rich Piana back in the day, rest in peace. And his best video to date is where he's talking about the freaking eight hour arm workout. A lot of people have probably heard of this, but um, it's basically an eight hour arm workout. And it's made up of 16 mini workouts every half an hour throughout the day for eight hours straight. And he just makes it sound so manageable and doable. And I just find that to be hilarious. I think it just comes down to the way that you need to receive it. That's ultimately the type of content creator that you're gonna come back to over and over again, because we all talk about the same fucking thing, bro. We're all talking about working out. Some of us take steroids, some of us don't. Some of us do calisthenics, some of us don't. But we're all trying to get y'all to the same thing. It's just about you hearing it in the way that is, you know, you're gonna receive the best. Here's one of my hot takes, bro. I'm just gonna say it. I really dislike how everybody and their mother is making videos about Sam and just profiting off his name. They're, they don't care that he takes steroids. They don't care that he, he had acne at one point. They don't care that he fucking smashes cereal. What they care about is, is that he's popular right now. There's something that you can say negative about him that will get people to click on your video. That's my hot take. I don't know how y'all feel about that, but that's why I said like, look, man, it just depends upon what you like. This next question comes from Patreon. They wanna know, what, how do I approach exercise ordering? There's two simple things that I do on a basic level or that I think about rather. What tasks do I have? And what's the most effective way to meet that task and reach that need? It's like the needs versus wants analysis that I talk about all the time in the Berserk Method videos. But 
basically what that boils down to is if you have the task of getting a bigger bench press, you fill up your program with bench presses first. And the easiest way to do that is to pick bench press specific stuff. Now, when it comes to actually ordering them, I like to think of it this way. We have our heavy exercises and then our light exercises. The heavier exercises are the ones that we're going to use to meet our goals. And then the lighter ones are to supplement that. How I order them is, is that I sandwich the light ones between the heavy ones so that we can recover stamina be, you know, between those heavy exercises and the muscle groups that are relevant to that. That is all just a giga brain way of saying that, look, we're doing our bench press. We're gonna do some rows or some pull downs in between that to allow our chest, pecs, triceps to recover. And then we're gonna hit another bench exercise. So dumbbell bench, whatever the case may be. Now, when it comes to emphasizing things, look, everybody knows that if you wanna emphasize something, you put it early in the program. I don't need to explain that to you. A caveman, a freaking, you know, the monkey on the typewriter, give them enough time to write Shakespeare. A monkey on a typewriter could, could freaking do that, bro. But when it comes to putting in things after that, we obviously have muscle groups on our body other than arms. If you're emphasizing arms, we got our pecs and triceps, we, we know our pecs and shoulders, we still need to train rather. How we go about doing that while making sure that we work everything adequately is that after you say smash your arms, you just pick a compound that doesn't rely on the strength and stamina of your arms for you to get in a good performance. Fly presses are perfect for that. Weighted ring push-ups are really good for that as well. Now, this is just my basic considerations that I make. And honestly, mostly everything that I think about with regards to making my free programs and if I have a client that I'm working with as well. It's just very basic shit. Now, it's, you know, part of being a good coach is making the right decisions. That's where free programs come into play. They, they hedge a lot of that decision making for you. And I'll kind of guide you in the right direction while teaching you how to make those types of decisions. So again, be Slayer in the description for y'all to try out fully customizable. Everybody's loving it. I recommend the hybrid version. Dude, what's with all the spicy hot takes today? This one is anti-fitness culture in general, dude. But essentially they said bulking and cutting, useless. Bulking and recomping, chef's kiss. Here's how I feel about that. It just depends upon where you're at and what your needs are. I know that's a boring answer, but say if you're cutting, your strength is going to be affected differently if you're cutting from 30% to 20% than if you're cutting from 20% to 8%, right? If you're cutting from 30 to 20%, you still have a good amount of fat on your frame, right? That's the same exact percentage as if you were dropping from 20 to 10, but the effects on your body are vastly different because in one scenario, you still have a good amount of fat on your body and the other, you really don't. Now, where I think that bulking and recomping really works for people is if one, this is going to be counterintuitive to what you've probably heard. I'm going to explain it in a way that makes sense. You're very advanced and you have a lot of muscle on your frame. You know how to pick the right exercises and you know how to advance in your training without relying on gaining a shit ton of body weight. And it's also for people that are deeper into a bulk. So at least 15%. This is just gonna depend upon what your, your, your natural set point is, right? So for me, my natural set point at this point in my adult life, just just based on you know being really lean for most of my adult life, like 10% or less, is around 10% body fat. I'm around 15% body fat right now, 205 pounds. A little bit more, a little bit less, depending upon the day. But since I have a higher relative amount of fat on my frame than like my baseline, and I'm very advanced, I know how to progress without gaining a shit ton of body weight all at once, I'm able to hold 205 pounds and then just focus on progressing in strength on my training. Now, some people are gonna listen to that and say, well, I've been told that you can't recomp unless you're new or you're on steroids. And I'm not saying anybody who, who has said that doesn't know what they're talking about. But what I'm saying is, is that when you're very advanced, you understand certain things about your body. And what you can observe is, is that you hold the most amount of muscle mass possible when you're, you know, 15% or higher. You know, honestly, dude, if we look at guys like uh, Andrew Richards, it's like the extreme example. I guarantee you that all things equal, he carries far more muscle on his frame than and people like to talk about these gentlemen as if they're hard limits for natties. But he carries far more muscle on his frame than Steve Reeves ever did, rest in peace, or any of the Silver Age guys, easily. He also carries a lot more fat, but that's just to say that if you have more fat on your frame and you're eating more food in general, 
you're able to carry and develop more muscle as well. So things like recomping does not work when you're lean. And I get where that's coming from when people say that. You cannot recomp really unless you take drugs if you're really lean. But if you have a surplus of resources on your body, fat, and then an intake of food, dude, you're gonna be able to hold body weights really effectively and still gain muscle and strength with that. Power lifters do it all the time. I'm doing it now. One more small thing that I'll say is that cutting, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, this is my hot take, we cut to make more room for bulking. I, I don't think there's any distinct advantage to cutting to sub 10% body fat unless you want to. And you know, it looks cool on social media with a pump and down lighting and just under very specific circumstances. But the natural sweet spot or unnatural if, you, if that's your inclination is like, 15% body fat, bro. You have enough fat on your frame to support your training. You have abs, you still have veins, your face is still lean, you don't have moon face, but you still have enough resources to be able to progress in your training and you still look good. That's beach lean, that is real life lean. That's like if you take your shirt off right now and go outside or you walk around outside, people remark at how fucking jacked you are if you're big and they talk about how lean and ripped you are. Like to the average person that is ripped. If you have abs, you have veins and your fucking muscles are big, you are ripped. This social media lean where you have to be 10% or you're fat is bullshit and it's why people do not make progress. Next fella has a question about long-term relationships and just what to do when shit gets boring and how to nurture a long-term relationship. Bro, I'm gonna keep it real with you and I'm gonna relate it to exercise because we need to bring it back to training and this is just the easy way to talk about it. I'm gonna tell you something that's very, very valuable. This is someone that is obviously, I'm a man like a lot of you are. I'm describing the psychology of someone that is new to dating and things like that. But when you're new to dating, all the glitter is same gold. So you, you, you have these options and you have these opportunities to meet different people and that's exciting. But I'm gonna tell you one thing, bro, and this is the God honest truth. You're not gonna encounter very many people that you're comfortable getting to know, that you like, you know what I'm saying? That you can be unabashedly yourself around, that you can tell them things about yourself that you've never told anybody before. And that you're comfortable being your worst self around them. You see what I'm saying? You're gonna find a lot of people that you're attracted to though, but you're not gonna get the same things substantially from one person that you will from another. That's just the God honest truth, bro. So don't sacrifice your connection with somebody for something that's temporary. Much the same, bro. You're not gonna find many exercises that are as good as the conventional deadlift or the squat or the bench press or the overhead press or preacher curls, but you're gonna have many tempting options that will you know, knock you off course if your goal is to get better at those things. So that's just my advice, bro. See, this is gonna be boring sometimes. That's okay, but that doesn't mean there's anything wrong. Next hot take, rings mog dumbbells for upper body training. The answer, my answer to this may shock you, but I think that they don't mob dumbbells. No, wait, listen, fellowship of the rings, hear me out. I'm gonna explain this in a way that makes sense. I think that rings are strictly superior for compound exercises when compared to dumbbells, if you're able to easily load them, right? But when we're talking, and this is just saying that you have like a backpack that's sturdy or like a Kensui weight vest or something like that, or some way to load them. But when we're talking isolations, I'm gonna keep it real with you. Dumbbells are superior in my opinion. They, I feel as though they have better resistance profiles. I think what the rings an advantage is, is that you can move them, but the, the same thing applies with the dumbbell as well. You see what I'm saying? And they also just fucking look cooler, bro. Like, you know, what are you gonna do? Ring curls or a hundred pound dumbbell curls in your face, bro? hundred pound dumbbell curls in your face. Kevin Lavroni didn't say ring curls in your face. He said 100 pound dumbbell curls in your face. So that's just my opinion. I, you know, again, that's just my opinion. This isn't gospel or anything. So you tell me what y'all think about that. Next fellow wants to know my thoughts on every minute on the minute for hypertrophy. So for those that don't know what that means, it's just every minute on the minute you do, we'll say between three and five reps of a barbell row or push up or whatever. And then you continue on for however many minutes you're gonna do that. It's basically a cluster set. I've talked about this in videos before and I really like it. I like anything that will allow you to get in more work in less time and that will build work capacity. And honestly, it's a fun way to go about doing those things. But methods are many, principles are few. I like anything that allows you to do that. 
cluster sets, every minute on the minute. I also like, and this, I got this from Leroy Colbert, it's super simple, bro. It's just 60 seconds rest intervals. I've been trialing that for different exercises. I don't do that for everything, but for things where I'm just trying to get in a good pump and get in a good workout, 60 seconds rest in between stuff. I'm doing that right now for barbell rows, hamstring curls. Um, I'm doing these forearm press downs that I saw Sam Solik doing. And I think I'm also doing it for, it's probably one other thing, pec flies. Yeah, the machine pec flies. I'm doing it for that too. And I really like it. It's fun. It's scalable as well, as long as you're willing to work hard. And when you're ready to switch back to something more conventional, the two have carryover to one another. So I really like that. Spicy, spicy hot takes, man. This one is power lifters can get jacked. Training for hypertrophy is cope. Do not understand that you're coping right now. That's all it is. Fellas, listen, you can't absolutely get jacked if you train for powerlifting. Look at Dan Green. And I also say that if you're coping, you're coping. Does that make sense, bro? So like if you're training for hypertrophy to cope for the fact that you are just ineffective in your strength training and you just don't know how to do it and things of that nature. So you, instead of you learning it, you're just doing something else. That's the definition of, of coping in, in, in my view. But you, I wouldn't say that that's coping overall because I'll tell you what, especially as you get more advanced and either the two training practices start to blend into one another. So there are things at a beginner or intermediate level that you'll need to focus on in either. And I'm not saying the two aren't distinct from one another. I'm gonna explain this in a way that makes sense because I don't want nobody saying, he said it's the same fucking thing, I'm not. What I'm saying is, is that regardless of your what your goals are, there is value to be had in knowing how to set up a, a periodized block in the way that you would with strength training. I'll give you an example. Once you get to a point in your hypertrophy training for reps where you're using an objectively large amount of weight and you've progressed objectively a far away from, you know, a far amount from when you started, you're going to need to space out when you're doing your heaviest sets and when you're working out with your heaviest weights. Much the same way that you can be advanced in a bench press, you can be advanced in a preacher curl. When you're repping like one, 130 pounds on the preacher curl for 10 reps, you, you're advanced in the preacher curl, for example, or you're doing skull crushers with 130 pounds for 10 reps strict. I'm not talking about like the pullover presses. Those are different. I'm just giving you examples. You need to set up when you hit those maximal weights and separate them from when you hit your lighter weights and then lead up to hitting that the same way that you would on a strength training program. Much the same on a strength training program, yes, your goal is to get stronger, but once you get to a certain point, you can't just spam neurological adaptation. You need to get bigger muscles, so you need to start to incorporate hypertrophy training practices into your program. Now, the measure in which you incorporate these things is different between the two. Again, I'm not fucking saying they're the same thing, so please don't infer that from this. But there is value to be had in knowing how to do a lot of shit that you, so you can apply the right tool in the right amount when needed. All right, one more quick question before we get to the last Q&A and the last hot take. But it's the first question on the channel. I said I would answer it, but they wanna know, how do you care for calluses like these? Mine are a lot less aggressive and huge than they used to be. So basically foundational things are what you wanna have. You wanna make sure that you're grabbing the bar deep in your palm and not in your fingertips. Because I, this is just my personal experience. What I found is if I'm if I have a looser grip on the bar, it's gonna naturally pull on your calluses more and pinch your skin into itself. That's how you get calluses in the first place. Now, if they're getting to the point where they're tearing, obviously you, you let them heal up, but they may be tearing because they get big. So just periodically file them down. And it's really that simple. This last question before we get to the BQ hot take part of the video, you know, BQ always gets the last word, bro. It just is what it is. But this is a great one that could honestly get its own video. And it might. Y'all let me know if you want a full video for this next question. But fella wants to know that, and by the way, bro, you're putting in a lot of good work with your powerlifting training. So keep it up. Um, I see you on Instagram. You're doing a great job. You know you are based on the question. But he wants to know if you can only do an exercise once a week for whatever reason, and you wanted to progress it, how would you go about doing that? This is an awesome freaking question because it, it gets people to focus on what's most important, right? By that, I mean, 
we have this way of structuring training from what I've seen other people do is that we focus more on the accessories than we do on what we're trying to get stronger. What I've always said is, is that we want to do enough of the thing that we're trying to get strong at to get better at that independent of everything else. My friend Sam does it the same way. Good friend Sam does the same same thing with his clients and his training. Meaning you should be able to just deadlift and get better at deadlifting. And if you can't, your progression and your plan for that is fucked up. What I say is just use a basic linear periodization. You start light, you end up heavy, and you're doing between three and five sets, working up to that you know single or top set of three or five or whatever. That alone should be good enough. But if I wanted to maximize progress and I can only do that one time per week, we'll talk about a few scenarios where you know that that's the case and this is gonna be helpful for those types of people. If I could only do it one time a week, the accessory work that I would pick would supplement that. And again, it's it has to be based upon the solid foundation. If if I remove this shit, I would still get better at it. We're talking about maximizing progress. I would pick accessories that work muscles that if they were bigger and stronger would help me to push more weight on that exercise. So for deadlifts, hamstring curls, back extensions, those are the two main ones. And then like some form of upper back exercise. So Sail rows, barbell bent over rows is probably what I would go for in this scenario because we can spare the extra lower back fatigue because we're only deadlifting once a week. And you know, for most people, you're not gonna get all the lower back work that you need in only deadlifting one time a week or doing a hip hinge one time a week. Um, and I would focus on getting strong at those. Now, depending upon where you're at strength wise, you could use like a double progression, triple progression, or you know, if you're especially strong at rows, you could even follow something like a linear periodization, you know, where you start light, end up heavy. The only difference is because you can't load a row as heavy as you can load a deadlift. Instead of you ramping up for eight to 10 weeks, you may ramp up for four or five weeks to a heavy weight. But that's just more so what I would do. Again, get, get your meat and potatoes in, make sure that that meat and potatoes is cooked well, and then supplement it with other shit at the end. Uh, one last thing that I'll say is, is if I'm only doing it one time a week, I would use ascending sets. What that means is a lot of people, they just don't take the time to properly warm up to do shit. I'm going to just keep it real with you. Some people do the bar, then a plate, four plates, and then they're you know going on to the working set. You do ascending sets at whatever number of reps your top set is going to, or working sets are going to be at. So if you're going to be doing working sets of five, you do five reps leading up to that. So you do five reps with the plate, you do five reps with a plate and a half, five reps with two and a half plates, five reps with three plates, three and a half, four, four and a half, five, to up to whatever amount of weight you're doing. What you're doing is you're getting in practice with your setup, you're getting practice doing reps, and this is going to supplement the fact that you're not doing that motion, or at least a variation of it, sometime later in the week. I found a lot of success with this myself personally. So the examples of when you only may want to do a lift one time a week. One, which is the most common, you just have other goals and you don't want to do too much of that thing to take away from those goals. So for me, I want to get fucking jacked. I'm trying to get to 210, right? Over the course of however long that'll take within a, within a reasonable body fat composition. I don't want to just, I could eat pizzas right now and be 210 tomorrow. You see what I mean? I want to be muscular. I want to be lean. I want to take my shirt off and the cheek is like what they see. You see what I'm saying, bro? And the lift that I'm talking about specifically right now is deadlifts. I'm doing deadlifts and RDLs. I'm only doing that one time a week and then I'm barbell rowing on the other day. And I'm doing, you know, hamstring curls as, as often as I can. And that's how I support that. Another instance is if you're just really fucking objectively strong and you can only recover from deadlifting one time a week. It's another instance where I would do that. And then lastly is somewhere in between the two wherein you can't recover from doing deadlifts more than one time a week. And you've tried the one and a half times frequency where you do deadlifts and then stiff legs and, or, or RDLs on another day. And that was too much for you as well. This is a very unique case and that's not most people. More, I'm gonna keep it real with you, bro. Most of y'all are not getting over fatigued in the lower back. That's actually pretty rare. You need to suck it up. It, and 
it's okay to be a little fatigued in the lower back. I'm just keep it real with you. Most people are not gonna fall into that last one, but there's just three instances where that can be applied. All right, BQ, the Raider captain, you already know, he gets the last freaking word. And this is his hot take today. And he doesn't give a fuck how you think. He says that your program doesn't need to be super complicated. It could actually be really fucking simple. And the biggest thing is emotional buy-in. Here's how I feel about that. BQ and I agree on most things related to training because we have similar sensibilities. What he's saying here is, is that if you have the best program possible, but you aren't emotionally bought into it, you're not gonna perform with passion. You're not gonna perform with precision or mindfulness or really give a fuck about your results. However, if you're invested in something that is still thoughtfully put together, but it's simple, so easy a caveman could do it, but you're giving it your 100% all, it's doing what you want it to, you're mindful and you're passionate, you're gonna make far better results than fella A ever could. Fella B is gonna mock fella A into oblivion all day, every day, and I thousand percent agree with that. Fellas, this was a really fun Q&A. Let me know how you feel about this. If you have any questions for next time, let me know. Y'all go ahead and watch these videos on the screen now that you've watched this one. Have a good day.